Hello, this is Jockin, coach of the San Francisco Cinderace. Uh, I thought I would do a quick recap on a couple of things uh, that were my big takeaways from season two of the SCL now that we're done. Uh, because this season has taught me a couple things that uh, I hadn't looked into too much before. Uh, and I thought I would record them here, mainly for my own use, but anyone else that's interested too. Uh, the first one up I wanted to talk about is how strong resist berries are. So, uh, they weren't something I had looked into too much. In fact, I didn't have the names of most of them memorized uh, prior to this season, but since we put the item cause into effect and it's a lot tougher to squeeze items onto teams, uh, it made me look into resist berries a lot more uh, and see just how strong they can be on the right Pokemon. Now, uh, don't get me wrong, they're not for everything. Like, say, uh, if I tried to put a Yachi Berry, which is the Ice Resist one, on my Flygon, it wouldn't be as successful as some of the ones I used. But, regardless, they're good on certain Pokemon, just like most items. Uh, so, quickly getting into what they do, uh, the Berries have damage from one super effective at uh, attack of a type based on the Berry, uh, and it's single use. So, not incredibly powerful at first glance. Uh, but I thought I would go over some of the examples that I used throughout the season. So, I believe it was 9, 10 teams I brought all season long for each match. Or no, I'm sorry, 11. Uh, and it was 7 of those had at least one Pokemon on them with a resist berry. Uh, so the most commons here were Grim Snarl with either Kevia to resist poison, Babiri to resist steel, uh, Lumberry for any sort of uh, status condition, and Akaberry and Shuckaberry on Aegislash. Uh, so the resist berries are mainly good on Pokemon that have uh, just single weaknesses. Anything with a quad weakness, like I said, Flygon with Ice or Quagsire or Seismitoad with Grass, it's not as effective. It can be useful that it can keep them alive for one turn longer, but I think it's a lot stronger in keeping something healthy rather than just surviving a one shot. Like, Take Grimmsnarl, for example. In the finals, with a Kevia Berry, he was able to take 20% from the first Poison Jab, or against, say, like a Kaparaja, he would only take, like, 30%, that sort of thing. But he's he's able to take a hit that would normally do over half his health, uh, somewhat healthy, and still get a lot of value out of the Pokemon that way, letting me take probably an extra two turns rather than just an extra one turn. So while they can be strong on... Things that have four times weaknesses, I think they're a lot stronger on things that only have two times weaknesses. And the other downside is that you have to be able to predict. Uh, not not so much in-game, but what your opponent's going to bring. You have to know, okay, they're going to bring a steel move to deal with Grimmsnarl. They're going to bring a poison move to deal with Grimmsnarl. So it's strong on these Pokemon with very few weaknesses like Age Slash and Grimmsnarl because you're able to tell what is going to be brought. On a bug type, for example, if you say Volcarona, you want to put a Resist Berry on, well that's a tougher call to make because it's weak to water, it's weak to flying and rock and all the other things that it has trouble with, you have a lot harder time figuring out exactly what berry would be best. So I think they're very strong, something I had underrated severely coming into the start of the season and something I plan to use uh, a lot more going forward. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to talk about was from uh, my match versus the Golden State Garchomps was probably the best example I have, and that's sacking Pokemon. So, uh, this team that I put together this season didn't have true defensive Pokemon. Vaporeon, Aegislash were probably my best defensive options, but they don't have recovery, like traditional recovery, like in a Roost type move. They, Vaporeon has Wish, obviously, but that takes quite a while unless you're running Protect and it's pretty passive if you're doing it that way so no true defensive Pokemon my team required a lot of very smart sacking that I would have to play things very carefully uh, understand when something wasn't useful anymore so that I could bring something else in safely because I don't have defensive walls to take hits or help uh, when I'm not sure a move is going to be used I had to sack things instead uh, so knowing when something has done its job and when you need to keep it around is very important. Like from this game, I can remember uh, Sinsino. I didn't need Sinsino based on the stuff he had brought. So Sinsino was something I knew, okay, if I get stuck and I don't know what to do, 
I can bring in Sinsino because it's not going to be able to do its job and it's not that useful. It's okay if it dies and just gets a knockoff off, for example. Uh, so, another example I could think would be, uh, or I should say an example of when I did this poorly was in my match, my first match against the Boston Bidoofs. Um, we, or I sucker punched the Gudra and got a, a speed drop from Sticky. And my plan had been to outspeed the Corbonite, and when that went out the window, rather than G-Max and uh, try and get some damage off, I decided I just wanted to sack Grimmsnarl after getting a plus one Sucker Punch off. And that was a bad decision because there were still things in the game I needed Grimmsnarl for, that he still would have been useful and I would have been better off getting rid of something else and keeping my Grimmsnarl healthy. Um, so that's another big one, is it, it helped me learn how and when I should be sacking Pokemon. And it's something that I think it's going to be important going forward regardless of what type team I have, so I'm glad I learned it right now. And another thing uh, I should talk about on... Let's see, what would be another good team for this? Probably one of my earlier ones if I had to guess. Let's try this one. So, I want to talk about how strong pivoting can be, because that's another thing my team does very well. It had a lot of pivot usage at the start of the season. We had uh, Cinderace, Flygon, Silvalli, Manectric, and Sinsino all had either U-Turn or Volt Switch, uh, and Silvalli had Parting Shot. So pivots are incredibly strong. The fact that uh, you get to deal damage and swap out if you catch something on the switch, it's incredibly safe because you get switch advantage then, um, and especially the chip damage is the part that I took big advantage of this season. Uh, it's a very good way to help teams like mine that don't have a good defensive answer. It lets you play around a lot safer that way. But something that I didn't have that I should talk about is just how strong that slow pivots are. Like, take a look at the team I brought here. All three of my things that are pivoting are all max speed, and the slowest one is still Valley at base 95 who still outsped most of my opponent's team. And now, it might, it might be somewhat counterintuitive, you're thinking, that why would I want to bring a slow Pokemon with a pivoting move? Well, the idea is, say, instead of bringing this Silvalli, I got rid of all the speed EVs and put them all into health so that he's a bulky Silvalli that's pretty slow. That lets the Silvalli take whatever hit is coming in and pivot out into something frail, like the Cinderace, so that the Cinderace can come in safely and deal damage on the next turn. So while I'm not saying that slow pivots are the best thing ever or incredibly safe, there's a reason you would want a slow pivot is what I'm trying to say. If your team has a lot of glass cannons, then having a bulky thing like a Mandibuzz that can learn U-turn would be incredibly helpful, I feel. So that's something I want to look into a little more, but I would say every team should have at least two pivots if you want to be... Uh, most effective is how I'm feeling after this season. You can probably get away without them, but having things like a Cinderace, a Dragapult, like I said, a Mandibuzz, or maybe even my Flygon to pivot is incredibly useful. I think uh, Corviknight could be another good option if you have a Corviknight or something like that. Even Darmanitan uh, gets U-Turn, and even though that's another fast pivoter, it's still very useful. So I would say get pivoters ideally you get one u-turner you get one volt switcher uh that helps mix it up that way you can't be walled by something physical that eats your u-turn you have something with a volt switch that still gets a pivot uh and for volt switch i should say there's a lot of good usage too rotom is probably the first one that jumps out to me uh toxtricity is another one and then you got stuff like raichu or monectric that i used on my team this season so anything that can volt switch is big too uh, and then the final thing I wanted to talk about uh, was on my Aegislash. Now, this season, uh, they got rid of Pursuit, which doesn't seem like a huge deal, but it was one of the main things that was keeping ghost types in check. And not only did they get rid of Pursuit, they got rid of Knockoff as well. Uh, and while Home has allowed Knockoff to come back, Pursuit is still not in the game. So. This generation, ghost types are incredibly strong. There's very few things that want to take ghost type attacks, with dark being the main one and normal being another, but neither of them are incredibly common types. 
So if your opponent wants to be able to deal with a ghost type, they usually have to go a little bit out of their way, either building something bulky they don't want to, bringing a Pokemon they don't want to to try and check it and deal with it, that sort of thing. So getting a ghost type like an Aegislash, a Dragapult, a Gengar, something like those lines, even a Poltegeist, that's a strong ghost type attacker, I think is very important uh, all throughout this generation. They're, they, it's an indirect buff is the way I would look at it, with Pursuit not being in the game. They're a lot safer, that you can bring them in and out without having to worry about it. And like I said, if you're playing without home moves where there's only a few things that get knocked off, it's very easy for ghost types to become strong very quickly. This season, Aegislash was able to run rampant through the league because there weren't very many teams that had like a powerful dark type. Like the ones I can think of off the top of my head, I would say Cronaut was one of the ones that could scare my Aegislash out for sure. And that's the only one I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Like there's not a ton that scare out like these top tier powerful dark types. Sure there's stuff that gets dark type coverage, but that's not going to take a, a ghost type hit very well. So if you have a Choice Specs Gengar, a Choice Specs or Banded Aegislash, a Shell Smashing Poltegeist, you're able to do so much work with them just because the ghost type is going to be able to just smash through practically everything if they don't have a normal type. Um, oh, that's... Uh, sorry, I just remember the other dark type. I was going to say Weavile was probably the only other one I could think of that uh, spooked my Aegislash too bad this season, dark types-wise. Uh, I guess Grimmsnarl as well, but he was picked up further down into the season and not immediately. Uh, but yeah, that was my last main thought, was that ghost types are going to be incredibly strong moving forward. So just in, in summary, the four big things. Resist berries are good. Uh, make sure they're powerful on the Pokemon that you're bringing them on. Four times weaknesses don't seem to be quite as effective as two times ones. Sacking Pokemon smartly. Knowing when something has done its job and you don't need it anymore. Uh helps incredibly if you don't have a defensive wall. Uh, pivots, being Volt Switch, Parting Shot, U-Turn, however you want to do it, I would say make sure you have at least two uh, on every team is my personal preference. Uh, it helps you get a lot of momentum, keeping what you want in and forcing your opponent to make switches. And looking into slow pivots, stuff like the Mandibuzz, or maybe like a bulky Darmanitan that can pivot out without being incredibly fast. I suppose Toxtricity fills the role too with its slightly lower base speed. Uh, and finally, Ghost Types. Drafting a strong Ghost Type in, like I said, the big four would be like Aegislash, Dragapult, Gengar, Poltegeist. Those four are probably the top tier Ghost Types. Drafting one of those uh, makes things incredibly easy because there's not a lot of things that want to deal with them. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be my four big takeaways from uh, Season 2. Like I said, this was mainly for my uh, own personal use so that I can go back and look at it later on down the line, but uh, if you watched, uh, thank you for listening to my somewhat uh, rambly explanation. Uh, that'll be everything for uh, Season 2. Uh, it looks like Season 3 is not going to start until uh, the DLC comes out in late June, so I plan on seeing you then. Uh, thank you for watching all of Season 2 with uh, the San Francisco Cinderace. I really appreciate it.